so I'm at the Riverhead Project. It's a uh, new restaurant that apparently opened up in Riverhead, uh, and they have a regular book project program, which is a, a literary program where they discuss, uh, you know, a, a particular highlighted book. And uh, this month, month of July, they actually chose uh, Long An Noir as their book project. Yay! So I'm uh, I'm there representing Long An Noir along with Ken Wishnia and uh, Jay Z Holden, who are in the anthology as well. So we're supposed to, I believe, give a reading and have a little bit of a uh, discussion afterwards. I want to check out the new restaurant. Supposedly it's very, very she-she looking for Riverhead. I grew up here my whole life. I never expected Riverhead to sort of bounce back the way it has, but uh, the town is actually quite vibrant. Um, anyway, I'll be uh, reading in a few minutes and I'm going to try to see if I can get somebody to actually videotape me, which is probably not going to happen. So this might be the only um, video I have of this exchange. Take care. I am so happy. Because I got to drink Ken's beer while I was waiting for him. <laughs> and I also am happy because I always wanted to live Creedence Clearwater Revival's line. If I had a dollar for every time I sung, every time I had to play while people sat there drunk. Right? To know what that feels like. <laughs> it feels like an honor. I, um, I appreciate uh, the invite here. It, it's hard when you're here representing a bunch of other writers, but the anthology is really, uh, really worth um, worth its weight. There's so there's such a diversity of stories in this anthology um, that it's not just sort of one note, and that's what I loved about it so much when I read it. Was that people come from people are coming from very different backgrounds, very different perspectives. We all sort of write dark, and it is noir, it is what it is, but. But I, I really enjoy the fact that I'm in an anthology with people who also write with great humor and write about people from different classes. So it's not just sort of a class warrior or uh, anthology. But my story is sort of class warrior-ish in that it's about a young man who has to go to Doon Road in West Hampton and uh, to rescue his brother uh, who has a drug problem. And he's been lured to this house, this mansion on Doon Road to... to um, uh, to, to, you know, he's been lured to Doon Road by this man who is posing to be a teenager on Facebook. He sort of gets on his way there, and his older brother goes to rescue him, and he's stopped by a police officer. And the police officer is none too kind to him, sort of wants him to, wants to question him and interrogate him because he sees on his license that he's from Mastic Beach. Um, and it's an experience that, that I'm sort of familiar with having to deal with coming from the community where I come from. And um, as I was born and raised in this beach, I'm happy to be told to turn around and go somewhere else, uh, to go back to where you belong. That's very odd, um, um, very, very disconcerting feeling to have to endure. And I, and I thought of what that was sort of in my mind when I wrote this story. Um, so I just wanted to read a couple sections of it uh, just to give you an idea of what it's about. Um, if I didn't already. Um, so I just want to start with the first instance of when he's sitting on the car and the police officer sort of makes him strip search. The, the police officer makes him strip down to nothing but his underwear and sit on his cold in the middle of January and sit on the roof of his car, go to his car, and um, while he checks out his, you know, his, his information to find out if he has any prior arrests or anything like that. Um, so he's thinking about growing up in the household with his younger brother and how maybe things all went wrong. So he describes how, how his brother sort of drifts in and out of the house. Somehow a door would be locked, and Nick's mother would bang to be let in. She'd know, but not really know, what he was doing in there. She suspected often, but only caught him once. Jeffrey had found his old skates and his hockey stick one day, and rolled through the house laughing, out onto the porch, sloshed across the grass like wading through water, and moved into the street. Nearly hit by a car, he spun around, slap shot a rock as it passed, ducked away from another car that honked. Then he skated off, crashed into the mailbox, and bounced back, bounced the back of his head off the street. When his mother ran out to him, some blood had trickled from his ear. She was too nervous sitting in the waiting room to wonder about how they would pay the bill for his stupidity. That was Nick's father's job. Staring up at the TV as if we were paying attention to the woman on Maury obsessed with knitting dog clothes. Her family crying and begging her to stop. He shook his head and stood up muttering, How does this happen? It happens, so said the doctor, because acid makes it happen. I found it in his system. It was complicating his concussion. Nick's mother wanted to see him. His father was pacing the floor, 
repeating stories of wrapping the bleeding heads of drunken sailors back from shore leave before they got shipped off to Vietnam. He hated the sight of bandages. He'd go in, he said, and make sure to only look at Jeffrey's feet. But the doctors wouldn't let either of them visit just yet. There were hurdles that he said. After that, Nick's mother put Jeffrey in all sorts of therapy sessions, which made the ghost in Nick's house seem like a ghost finding final peace. Drifting away, only the stories of him began to fill the rooms. How long he'd been using, how poorly he fit in at school, and another piece of puzzling information that had somehow been tucked away from his parents all these years. He had a vastly above average IQ, a superior genius rating, said one doctor, and he asked if they hadn't noticed this. They hadn't. Nick's father had actually suspected the opposite. The doctor asked if they'd ever witnessed Jeffrey pick up a violin or sit at a piano and start making sense of it, but they admitted that they never had instruments lying around the house. They weren't really music people, Nick's mother said, though that wasn't really what she meant. If you had instruments, you might have caught this. It's generally where extraordinary intelligence plays itself out, the doctor said. He shook their hands after their meeting. Nick could offer nothing to the investigation his parents launched after that to get to the bottom of of who knew about Jeffrey's genius. The only thing Nick was able to contribute was an instance when they were in elementary school waiting at the bus stop and fat Danny Euclid was challenging other kids to fight. And Jeffrey told Nick that Danny was the only person he would never fight because he had no triangles. He was only circles. When they boarded the bus, Nick asked him what he meant. Jeffrey, second grade and laughing all the time, went into an explanation of a system of his own making, that people are made of shapes, mostly triangles. And you can beat people who have a lot of triangles because triangles are clumsy. He could see when people had triangles and when people didn't. In fact, Danny Euclid didn't. He was all circles, and circles could not be knocked over. No one's ever seen an upside-down circle. When Nick's mother finished listening to the story, she told Nick it sounded idiotic. Nick agreed, except Nick said, squinting, I still remember that, because it's sort of true. I just want to read this last little section. Um, he's, he's told by the police officer to just basically go back to Massive Beach and wait now. Uh, and hear, you know, and, and to uh, you know, wait to hear word from, from them about what happened to his brother, if they find it at all. Um, <clears throat> so he's heading home and he has more time to sort of think about his situation and about his brother. His body warmed as he blasted the heat and watched the slick surface of twin ponds glide by his passenger window, frozen under a foot of ice. Winter birds waddled with their young through pads cleared by skaters. Every star was visible. It made everything inside Nick seem immense. Earth, a place to be swallowed. Massive beach, a labyrinth. Guilt, anger, love, unavoidable. Life, long. Stars, mighty things to hide between. Wilding birds in their roost, sage in their simplicity. It stuck in his chest to think so, but just then, he wanted Jeffrey to run. Run and hide and disappear, even if it meant he would never see him again. Jeffrey wasn't part of the same world. Nick knew this now. He'd break spirits that tried to ground him. It was bigger than all of them. Nick was mistaken to try and find him. For what? And who would he find? And do what? And how would he convince something that had sailed away so long ago to come back over the bridge? To his own destruction. The cop even told him so. He shook his head at how, just hours ago, he was praying to find him. A short while ago, he breathed the relief that a cop might be able to find him. Now he couldn't imagine a worse fate. And wasn't that how the world he lived in really was? Always having to wait for a bad thing to happen so it makes way for something potentially good? He pulled into his driveway and idled there. The heat was still on. Light bled white and silver onto the frost covered lawn where his mother pulled the front door open. He watched her peer through the reflection of their glass door, shield her eyes and press her face against the glass. She focused on Nick. The exhaust pulsed, stacked clouds of mist around his car. Nick watched her and then looked over at the empty passenger seat where he knew his mother was hoping to see her other son. He looked at the seat and half smiled at Jeffrey. Not there, but never before so close. Thank you.